I'm not surprised and I think it was necessary. I mean, the truth is over a number of days now, it was apparent uh, 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 it was not uh, if but when. And the longer it had dragged on, the more I'm afraid we were seeing the country and the Conservative Party um, embarrassed by, by the whole situation. So I, I wish he had gone sooner, frankly, saying that was, it was in everybody's interest, but better late than never. What do you think was his undoing? How will his premiership be remembered? I think someone with very real talents, uh, who had some real achievements, and undoubtedly winning a majority in 2019 was a real achievement, and I think that was in the country's interest then. Um, I think his skills as a communicator and campaigner were, were very great, and he brought great energy um, to the job, and that was valuable in dealing with the vaccine rollout, which has made a huge difference in the UK, and he's shown leadership in Ukraine. Unfortunately, there were real and ongoing flaws of character and judgment. And I think that ultimately was his undoing. Do you feel this resignation might prompt some introspection within the party about ministerial standards and behaviour? I mean, you've packaged it quite nicely, flaws in judgment, but how does this premiership affect the party going forward? I think it's left us very bruised. Uh, and I think it, it teaches us that if you are going to ask the country to make some pretty heavy sacrifices, as we did over uh, the pandemic, um, but also we're going to have to going forward with the economic challenges that, 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 that we face. Um, uh, you've got to be absolutely straight with people. You can't have any suspicion or hint of double standards, but you've also got to tell it to people as it is, um, uh, rather than obfuscating. I think maybe we need a little more humility. Uh, and also, I think, uh, as a party, we've got to, the new prime minister has got to broaden the base of the government. Uh, we were drawing, I think, the, the, the government from too narrow a pool of, of people in the party uh, who seem sometimes been promoted almost entirely because of their loyalty uh, to, to, to Boris rather uh, than because perhaps of the particular skill sets that they brought. Um, we should bring in a much wider group of people, some who've been in government before, some who ought to be in government and haven't yet had the chance. I think that's really important. So, Bob, if you were invited to form part of the next government, what would your response be? What any other future prime minister does will, will be entirely up to them, Ros. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sitting waiting by any telephones, put it that way. I've got plenty of other big jobs to do. OK, so before we move on, how can the party start to rebuild trust with the public, especially since Boris Johnson did face a vote of no confidence only a short while ago and the majority of Tory MPs supported him? Yeah, and I, what I think happened then is simply that that was a quite spontaneous, uh, unorganised um, expression of exasperation at the way things were going. Um, people might have been prepared to, to see if lessons were learnt and there could be a reset. And then, of course, along came the, the, the Chris Pincher saga and lessons had been learnt. Um, and therefore, resetting the dial was impossible uh, under the Prime Minister. Um, uh, so uh, I think that's sort of uh, part of the lessons and that's left us very bruised uh, as a part of say the priority now has to be absolutely ruthless focus on policies, enough of a sort of personality cults. Um, uh, it's not about um, charisma. It's about competent, able government. Um, it's about getting a real grip on the financial challenges that we have now post-COVID. We have a cost of living crisis. It's manifesting itself in a raft of areas. We need to really get on top of that. We need to make sure uh, that we deal with important issues uh, on the foreign front in relation to Ukraine. We need to resolve the outstanding tensions with, with, that we have with the, the European post-Brexit and obviously supporting Gibraltar in getting a, a stable and viable agreement with Spain, which we all want to see is, is a key part of that from both our perspectives, uh, but actually get down to the serious business and just concentrate on that. I don't think we need culture wars. I don't think we need uh, some of the uh, needless uh, and not absolutely essential uh, issues that have been talked about too much. Well, you've mentioned Gibraltar. The government here is in the middle of highly sensitive and crucial talks to close an agreement on a future relationship with the EU. Now, will this instability or perceived instability at number 10 affect those talks? And could the EU take advantage of what might be seen as a weakness in the heart of the UK government? Uh, they certainly shouldn't attempt to, because I think the support for Gibraltar and uh, the determination of the UK government uh, to uh, stand full, bit, full square behind Gibraltar in these negotiations won't change. Um, the Foreign Secretary remains in place uh, and 
Gibraltar, I know, is, is, is firmly cited on her desk. Um, uh, I, I also know that uh, uh, many of the continuing members of the cabinet uh, are well cited on the issue. Um, Robert Buckland, who has returned to the cabinet, former Lord Chancellor, and I have talked about it a good deal, James Cleverly, who was, of course, until recently the minister uh, dealing with um, the European neighbourhood and looking after Gibraltar's issues is now in the cabinet. So Gibraltar will have well-informed friends uh, in the British government, as well as the continuation of the foreign secretary. And I think I'm glad to say support of all the other parties in parliament too. So it's that, that, that you never like a, a change, but um, I think we're well capable of seeing off any attempt to take advantage of that. Okay, so let's look forward to the months ahead. What did you make of Boris Johnson's resignation speech? He said he'll stay on as Prime Minister until a new party leader is selected, but you've raised concerns about that. Why is that? Well, I do have concerns because um, uh, unlike Theresa May, where there was a policy disagreement, um, but she sat a timetable um, uh, and we could all, people could live with that, uh, precisely because Boris's departure is around um, issues of character and trust, um, I don't think it's going to be easy for us to get on with rebuilding the trust of the British public uh, whilst he's still there, even in an, an interim basis. So, of course, you can't have a vacuum. The Queen must always have a, a Prime Minister. Uh, but I do think we should be moving very swiftly uh, to put in place a new leadership election. I think waiting uh, until the autumn isn't acceptable. I've been urging my colleagues uh, to uh, change the rules swiftly so that the MPs can carry out their part of the process next week. And I think we should then aim to do a very quick uh, ballot of the membership. Um, you can't have a set of rules that works, that was drawn up when our party was in opposition back in uh, the 1990s, doesn't work for governments where you have to have, if not continuity of personnel, at least to have uh, offices in place. So I think that needs to be changed very quickly. If that were the case, frankly, I would prefer that Boris went and say somebody like Dominic Raab, the Deputy Prime Minister, stepped up into an acting role. Now, you said you'd like the new leader to look towards the broader talent in the party rather than just their own acolytes. So what other qualities would you like to see in a new Conservative Party leader? Uh, uh, perhaps uh, going back to a little as what I said earlier, Ros, I, I think competence um, uh, and integrity are, are, are the two key things. And integrity comes first under those circumstances. Uh, and that integrity comes from demonstrating uh, that you uh, are straight with people, that you stick to your word, uh, and uh, that um, you don't overpromise, uh, that you make sensible promises and you then deliver on them and you focus uh, upon delivering. Uh, it's not about words, it's about action. OK, I have to ask you the question, who do you think will be the next party leader? I, I thought you probably asked that, Ros, <laughs> and I'm sorry, but I, I'm not going to uh, come out, pluck a name out of the, the hat for two reasons, actually. One, um, my criticisms, which you, you know, know have been there uh, about Boris, have been there for some time, and I've not done that as part of any organised campaign for any particular person to replace him. I've done that from my own judgment and, and conscience. I, I simply say I think that there are a number of contenders. I could think of half a dozen people. Tell us a few names. Any underdogs? I, I, I think you've already got many of the many of the media names uh, being touted. Former cabinet members, um, uh, existing cabinet members, underdogs. Well, you can you, you can never tell. But I think I think most of the names are. I do think it actually there's a strong argument that when you are in government, it has to be someone who has already had ministerial experience. And that's that's easier to do differently in opposition. Um, David Cameron and Tony Blair hadn't, but their parties were in opposition. So if you like, they had time to play themselves in before they um, walked straight in and started chairing the cabinet meetings. So that, that's just the one thing I'd say. So what would your message to Gibraltarians at this trying time be? Well, I can understand that they have, in Gibraltar, you've got issues to contend with in terms of the deal with Spain. Um, do rest assured that this will not be a distraction, as I said earlier in the interview. Um, the APPG on Gibraltar, your friends in the British Parliament, are still absolutely 100% behind you. And we are still watching Gibraltar's back in Parliament. We're continuing to do that. Uh, whoever uh, the personnel are in government, so I promise you that doesn't change. And the support I know is absolutely unaffected uh, by uh, any uh, moving vans arriving at Downing Street.